He wrote and said to me, Virginia, your little friends are wrong. They have been affected by the skepticism of a skeptical age. They do not believe except they see. They think nothing can be which is not comprehensible by their little minds. All men's minds, Virginia, are little. In this great universe of ours, man is a mere insect, an ant in his intellect, compared to the boundless world around him, as measured by an intelligence capable of grasping the whole of truth and knowledge. Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. He exists as certainly as love and generosity exist, and you know that they abound and give to your life its highest beauty and joy. Alas, how dreary would be the world if there were no Santa Claus. It would be as dreary as if there were no Virginias. There would be no childlike faith then, no poetry, no romance to make tolerable this existence. We should have no enjoyment except in sense and sight. The eternal joy with which childhood fills the world would be extinguished. Not believe in Santa Claus. You might as well not believe in fairies. Is it all real, Virginia? Ah, uh, there is nothing else in all the world that is real and abiding. No Santa Claus. Thank God he lives, and he lives forever. A thousand years from now, Virginia, nay, ten times ten thousand years from now, he will continue to make glad the heart of childhood. Yes, Virginia and West Virginia, there is a Franklin Roosevelt policy today. Hi, I'm Randy Becht, I'm the moderator for tonight. I'm the president of the United Steelworkers Local 4907. And I'm president of the Northern Tier Central Labor Council of Pennsylvania AFL-CIO. Uh, we're going to have several speakers tonight. There are experts on the subject of Franklin Roosevelt and how his policies of like New Deal and, and, and how he got us out of World War II and the mobilization compares to our situation today. Uh, we're going to, uh, we got, I'm going to introduce the speakers as, as they come along. And the first speaker tonight is Stephen Fenberg. He's author of The Unprecedented Power, Jesse Jones, Capitalism. It's a good book. <laughs> uh, Mr. Fenberg, you're up. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to report that Santa Claus's spirit still exists in the form of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, a great model for us to look at today with hope for a new infrastructure bank. The Reconstruction Finance Corporation was started by Republican President Herbert Hoover, for, who for after three years of declaring the depression will end, the economy is sound, we should all volunteer to help each other, um, said that, it was time to use the power of government to solve the catastrophe of the Great Depression. So he started the Reconstruction Finance Corporation during his last year in office to make loans to banks, insurance companies, and railroads, thinking that would restore confidence and end the Great Depression. In fact, it was so successful during his last year in office he expanded its lending authority to almost the size of the entire federal budget at that time, which was only $4 billion. Nonetheless, he kept enlarging it because it was working so well. Nonetheless, one of its board members, Jesse Jones, would later say, if Hoover had started the RFC, the nation's vital infrastructure bank, two years before and had judiciously loaned five to seven billion dollars, the worst of the Great Depression could have been avoided. When Franklin Roosevelt became president, he made Jesse Jones its chairman and he supercharged the RFC. Congress within days of his inauguration uh, 
create uh, pass legislation to allow the RFC to buy preferred stock in banks to recapitalize them so they could lend again. And it's important to know that when Roosevelt was inaugurated, all the banks were closed. The financial system had completely collapsed. Unemployment was 25%. Gross national product had been sliced in half. Stocks had lost 75% of their value. Suicide rates had tripled. So the RFC, was able to start buying preferred stock in banks to capital, recapitalize them so they could lend again. That same strategy was duplicated in 2008 during the Great Recession, uh, known as TARP, the Troubled Asset Relief Program. It was modeled precisely on what Jesse Jones and the RFC did in 1933. The trouble was in 1933, the banks had all this new money from buy, selling their preferred stock to the government, but they were sitting on the cash. They were, were petrified to use that money to put it out into the economy. So Jesse Jones and Roosevelt said, if you don't start lending this money, the RFC will have to step in and be the lender of last resort. And that's exactly what it did. After that, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation through lending, not spending, and that's the important distinction of the RFC and the new proposed infrastructure bank. The RFC saved thousands of homes, farms, banks, and businesses. It financed the development of high-speed rail. It built bridges, tunnels, aqueducts, and highways. It developed water systems in cities so they had safe drinking water, an issue that we are confronting today. Uh, and it brought electricity to rural America when 20% of the population there had power, 80% did not, they lived in the dark. And then it helped them buy appliances so they could plug into the modern age through credit, through lending. And what's so interesting about all of this, all of these massive programs during the worst economic catastrophe in our nation's history made money for the federal government, much like a new infrastructure bank can do today. It can fill the gap for President Biden's new infrastructure uh, legislation, which is wonderful. I'm so happy that it was passed, but we will find that it is adequate. It will not fulfill the needs of our nation's vitality, like an infrastructure bank can do. It can fill the gap by lending instead of spending. In fact, the RFC was so successful through its lending that it helped finance Roosevelt's spending programs like the WPA and the PWA, which we will hear from Dr. Hopkins in just a moment. And Roosevelt's programs and the RFC's strategies worked. Within four years of Roosevelt's inauguration by 1936, Detroit was turning out more cars in 1936 than it had in 1929. Unemployment dropped by 8% and industrial output had doubled. And all the while war is spreading in Europe and the United States was completely unprepared. Our military at the time ranked 17th in the world. Germany had 9,000 airplanes, Japan had 7,500 airplanes, and we had about 2,500 antiquated airplanes that were left over from World War I. And Roosevelt's hands were tied, but he knew he needed to act. Neutrality acts prevented him from uh, selling arms to warring nations, and the public was vehemently opposed to intervention unless the United States was directly attacked. But thankfully, Roosevelt had his infrastructure bank in Jesse Jones. So a full 18 months before the attacks on Pearl Harbor, Jesse Jones and the RFC began building thousands, literally thousands of massive factories to manufacture the trucks, tanks, airplanes, and ships required to fight and win World War II. And their efforts were comprehensive. In addition to building tens of thousands of airplanes, it was also manufacturing high octane gas to fuel the planes. It was building schools to train aviators. It cornered the market in silk and wool to uh, for uniforms and for parachutes. Everything it did was cohesive. And I can't help but think that if we had 
manage to corral that kind of power and force at the onset of the coronavirus, what we could have done then, or how we can use that same uh, power to address the more frequent intense weather events. I want to go back to the EHFA, the Electric Home Farm Authority, that, uh, that helped people buy appliances on credit once they got electricity brought to their homes through the Rural Electrification Administration, because it is a great example of how RFC strategies can be used today. That same mechanism can be used to help people retrofit their homes so they're energy efficient, storm resistant, and wired for the digital age. You can spread broadband across the nation through this kind of strategy, and then you can help people through lending, buy devices to plug into the modern age, just like the RFC did back in the 1930s. And it made money when it did it for the federal government. So the United States uh, was able to mobilize their forces and uh, support the allied forces to win World War II. Maybe one of the most amazing feats was it, it developed synthetic rubber, again, 18 months before the attacks on Pearl Harbor, when the Japanese took our supply of natural rubber. So the RFC got together the, the heads of corporations, universities, and scientists and figured out how to manufacture the substance. It built the plants, it leased them to corporations, which is how it manufactured and uh, produced everything that it did during World War II. And I, I kind of chuckle when people, you know, laugh and think about good government as socialism. And I think, well, how do they imagine World War II was won? It was through the power of good government in concert with corporations. And the RFC had every ability or every opportunity to nationalize banks during the Great Depression, to nationalize industry during World War II, but that was never its intent. It wanted to save capitalism during the Great Depression and save democracy during World War II, and that's exactly what it did. And the RFC, like an infrastructure bank today, was embraced by liberals, conservatives, Republicans, Democrats, and it made loans in every con congressional district in the United States of America. And it was loved by almost everybody. And I think that a new infrastructure bank today, if we embrace it as something patriotic that everybody can benefit from, it will restore the vitality of our nation. That is what we should do. We should look at the RFC as a model for today. And I will now turn back the talk to our moderator. Thank you, Mr. Fedner, very good. Uh, next up, our speaker is Dr. June Hopkins. She's a PhD, it's professor of history emerita uh, at Georgia Southern University, and she's author of Harry Hopkins, Sudden Hero, Brass Reformer. Dr. Hopkins. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here, and thank you, Stephen, for that wonderful introduction to the NIB. Um, as candidate and as president, Joe Biden has been very clear that he planned on dealing with the nation's problems resulting from a pandemic, an economic recession, and a threat to our democracy with action comparable to FDR's New Deal. This is why he won in a landslide election in 2020. There are clear parallels between the social and economic upheavals of the 1930s and the serious problem President Biden is facing today. And so far, he seems to be using FDR's playbook to address them. Today, there is widespread unemployment. And this has a devastating effect on the nation's economy. On top of this, our infrastructure is crumbling and needs immediate attention. In 1933, FDR promised action and action now. With 25% of workers unemployed, he promised he would use the power of the federal government in what he deemed a war against unemployment. And this is where my grandfather came in. Harry Hopkins' goal as FDR's Federal Relief Administrator remained consistent throughout the decade. He believed it was the federal government's responsibility to provide, worker, to provide for workers who could no longer support themselves or their families. During the first 100 days, at the urging of the president, Congress passed the FERA, the Federal Emergency Relief Act, 
with an initial appropriation of $500 million and established the FERA, the Federal Emergency Relief Administration. When the president tapped Hopkins to run it, he told the Washington newcomer two things, get relief out fast to those who need it and pay no attention to politics or politicians. The FERA handed out money to destitute Americans because Hopkins were starving, because Americans were starving to death in the United States. This was of course, direct relief, cash, the dole. But very soon Hopkins and the president realized that people wanted the dignity of a job. They wanted to work for a wage. So the FERA created jobs, mostly construction and infrastructure work to let them work off their relief payments. One had to be on the relief rolls to get an FERA job. This was better than cash relief, but it was not ideal. In November, 1933, it became increasingly clear to Hopkins that the FERA's work relief program was not putting enough people to work. Anticipating a dangerously cold winter, Hopkins on November 9th, 1933, presented the president with a plan whereby the government would become the main contractor for jobs. It was a wild idea. But FDR signed an executive order creating the temporary Civil Work Administration, the CWA, with Hopkins at its head. Using $400 million of FERA funds and $350 million from Harold Ickes Public Works Administration, the PWA, Hopkins again worked fast, cut through red tape, and 11 days later, by November 20th, he had transferred all reliefers to CWA roles. CWA jobs paid the prevailing wage. Anyone could apply for a CWA job. You did not have to be on the relief rolls. CWA jobs were real jobs for real wages, not emergency relief, and people knew it. It put 4 million people to work on approximately 4,000 projects within four weeks and within two months had mobilized as many people as were called to the colors during the First World War. By the spring of 1934, over 200,000 projects had been initiated and the CWA became the nation's largest employer, spending almost $1 billion. Always meant to be temporary, the CWA ended in the spring of 34. Its work programs were folded back into the FERA. Still, more than 11 million workers were unemployed and on the relief rolls. 80% of them were fully employable. In the State of the Union speech in January 34, President Roosevelt said that, quote, continued dependence on relief induces a spiritual and mental disintegration fundamentally destructive to the national fiber. To dole out relief in this way is to administer a narcotic, a subtle destroyer of human spirit. He said work must be found for the able-bodied but destitute workers. Hopkins was also convinced that this was absolutely essential for the nation's economic health and was also consistent with American values. He insisted that the opportunity to work was an inalienable right for all. Hopkins' plan for a permanent federal jobs program was unfortunately eliminated from the economic security bill. It was too radical. The president instead called for a temporary government work program and encouraged Congress to pass the Emergency Relief Appropriation Act in 1935. It allotted $4 billion to provide jobs for those on relief on the dole and created the WPA, the Works Progress Administration. Roosevelt appointed Hopkins to lead this ambitious employment and infrastructure program. Over its eight years of existence, the WPA put roughly eight and a half million Americans to work and spent $10.7 billion. Perhaps best known for its public works projects, the WPA also sponsored projects in the arts. The agency employed tens of thousands of actors, musicians, writers, and other artists. You can go on the Living New Deal website, livingnewdeal.org slash map to see the thousands of WPA programs without, throughout the United States. You can see that no city or town was untouched by WPA projects. WPA workers built more than 4,000 new school buildings, erected 130 new hospitals, laid 9,000 miles of storm drains and sanitary sewer lines, built 20, 29,000 new bridges, et cetera, et cetera. Many more useful projects. Hopkins, ever the optimist said, I believe that full employment can be attained within the framework 
of our traditional democratic processes and that every man able and willing to work had, has a right to the opportunity to secure the reasonable necessities of life. But not only would government rescue, not only would government jobs rescue unemployed workers, they would boost consumerism and aid in the national economic recovery. This New Deal playbook clearly lives today in President Biden's agenda. He is of action and action now, and alluding to Hopkins' commitment to ensure that Americans are afforded a decent job and a decent standard of living. FDR promised to improve the lives of Americans with the Social Security Act. Biden is doing this with his Build Back Better, his BBB framework to improve the lives of Americans. One can even ask if BBB is going to be an alphabet agency like the New Deal agencies, the FERA, the PWA, the CWA. And this may even be the beginning of another serving of alphabet soup for the American public. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hopkins. We appreciate it. We will now hear from President Franklin Roosevelt. It is three months, my friends, since I have talked to the people of this country about our national problems. But during this period, many things have happened. And I'm glad to say that the major part of them have greatly helped the well-being of the average citizen. In the short space of these few months, I am convinced that at least four million have been given employment, or saying it another way, 40% of those seeking work have found it. That does not mean, my friends, that I am satisfied or that you are satisfied that our work is ended. We have a long way to go, but we are on the way. We come to the relief for a moment of those who are in danger of losing their farms or their homes. I have publicly asked that the foreclosure on farms and chattels and homes be delayed until every mortgagor in the country has had full opportunity to take advantage of federal credit. And I make the further request that if there is any family in the United States about to lose its home or its farm, that family should telegraph at once, either to the Farm Credit Administration or the Home Loan Corporation in Washington requesting their help. I do not hesitate to say that although the prices of many products of the farm have gone up, and although many farm families are better off than they were last year, I am not satisfied. It is definitely a part of our policy to increase the rise and to extend it to those products that have as yet felt no benefit. If we cannot do this one way, we will do it another. But do it, we will. Okay, up next is Dr. Stephen Hubbard, PhD. He's an infrastructure bank expert. He's Franklin Roosevelt Administration Economic Authority. He's a former senior GIS analyst and of the Metropolitan Water Department. Dr. Hubbard. Okay, so I'm going to talk briefly about what the RFC did and how it applies to today. So a little bit of this has already been covered. In 1939, the United States had somewhere between the 17th to the 19th smallest army in the world. It was almost insignificant. It was smaller than Portugal. We only had about 2,500 planes that had been mentioned. Maybe if you're generous, about 200 were useful for combat, but the, they might not have survived very long. In terms of production, we um, just two things I'm going to look at, aluminum and synthetic rubber. Um, aluminum was 164,000 tons and, and synthetic rubber was basically nowhere. It was a little bit that was uh, experimental. And then just uh, four, four to five years later, the Army was 30 times uh, larger. We had 80,000 planes and stunningly we were producing 8,000 planes a month, which no one believed could ever happen. Aluminum was up um, almost by a factor of 10 and synthetic rubber was nil, near a million pounds. Um, and among others, uh, for that plane production, uh, some of the planes, of course, were the B-24, which were coming off of uh, Ford's River Rouge plant. And um, they were producing one plane an hour, finally, in 1945, with 110,000 parts in it. And that's also something that no one ever believed could happen. And all of this, of course, was because of the RFC and uh, cooperation. 
So going into uh, World War II, there were bets placed by both Hitler and Tojo as to how the war would go. And so uh, Hitler, of course, in Nazi Germany, uh, felt that they would defeat, that his uh, form of government would win out over democracy because basically U.S. industry was too profit hungry to work together. And they had basically had created an amalgam of uh, industry and government, and he felt that that was vastly superior to anything the United States could ever do. And in uh, Japan, basically Tojo and the, and the War Council felt that the disparate racial and social groups in the United States would never be able to cooperate. And of course, this was the view of a homogeneous culture that was bringing war to the world so that they could all experience the uh, superiority of uh, Imperial Japan. And so basically then to win this battle, um, government, the, basically the racial and social groups all work together, and especially industry and government work together. And this is where the production miracle came from, as the United States literally went from a dead stop to outproducing the combined combination of Japan and Germany in just two and a half years. And both of those countries had a 10-year running start to get into war production. And this was because of the loans from the RFC and the cooperation between government. And so among others, we've talked about synthetic rubber. So as an example, there was basically at the start of the war, there was a question is like, what was the most important thing to do? And it actually wound up, if you read Donald Nelson's The Arsenal of Democracy, it turns out buying some ore carriers to get more ore to uh, steel uh, for steel production was the most important thing right at the start of the war. And it turns out the steel that was made from that or those early ore carriers went, went into the planes that helped build uh, win the battle of Midway. It was that tight a race to um, win, win World War II, but also synthetic rubber it turned out then became the, or rubber became the most important and valuable commodity in the entire country because everything either required rubber, whether it was being made for the production facilities or going into it. So for instance, a tank needed a ton of rubber, um, a battleship 75 tons, every um, uh, person in combat um, needed 20, uh, 32 pounds of rubber for all of their gear and sh sh uh, um, shoes and everything else. And so creating the synth synthetic rubber industry, went, which was basically, um, uh, there was nothing existed beforehand, was part of the RFC's work to uh, get five first um, uh, test plants going, which were criticized as being an outrageous waste of money. And then in three months later, after it became clear of just how crippling the shortage would be, um, Jesse Jones was criticized for not moving quickly enough and that why weren't these plants bigger and producing more because it was going to take a while to get them going. Some of the others also, what we got from the enormous industrial effort and the cooperation between government and industry was uh, advanced metal manufacturing where um, vanadium, tungsten, uh, uh, titanium, um, and aluminum were all we learned how to produce them in industrial quantities and manufacture them in industrial quantities. Of course, I talked about the River Rouge plant with producing a B-24 every uh, hour. And of course, the um, B-29, which cost three times the amount of the to create the atomic bomb to carry it. And both of those led to the modern civilian aircraft industry and, and why U.S. has been basically first in aerospace for so many decades afterwards. The machine tools, um, there was a machine tool that was created that would literally weld a Sherman tank. They discovered that they could produce them several times faster if they welded them together, but that was a time consuming process. And someone came up with a jig that basically took the entire tank, tank and spun it around and welded it. And so this is what enabled us to outproduce uh, Germany and win the, the tank battle. Steel, we learned how to produce enormous quantities in both uh, plate and sheet. And the entire petrochemical industry was pretty much born during World War II. Um, it had, there had been some of it, of course, beforehand, but the explosion in synthetics and the realization of what you could do with uh, petrochemicals came from World War II. And then finally, pharmaceuticals, um, the little known effort to get the volume production of penicillin which uh, turns out there was a, a moldy cantaloupe that was found in a supermarket um, by one of the administrative staff, a woman who was shopping and they were told anything that's uh, moldy. And so this uh, turned out to be the grandfather of all penicillin that's used today because um, it would grow through a volume of liquid rather than just on the surface. 
And there's arguments as to like what helped win World War II. Was it the uh, B-29? Was it all the things you, I've just talked about? Was it the atomic bomb? And there's a, a significant argument to be made that it was penicillin. Why? Because more people for the first time in any war um, died in combat than died from wounds after the war and it saved millions of lives. So where are we today? And so how does this uh, apply today? So the, the question is, was of course Senator Manchin said, uh, Biden was not elected to be Roosevelt. And so this begs the question, do we need a Roosevelt today? And uh, the answer winds up being absolutely yes. And why is this? Well, if you look backwards, you can convince yourself that uh, Senator Manchin has that we're still in the post-World War II bloom phase with the golden era. Annual growth is four to 6%. Most of our infrastructure is new or under 50% of its design life. Coal will be a major fuel for the next 50 years. And the United States has the number one infrastructure in the world. And the reality, um, most of our infrastructure is 50 to 100% past its design life. GDP growth is only 1.7 to 2.3% or one third to one quarter with uh, corresponding uh, dramatic loss in tax revenue. Um, uh, especially for West Virginia, the lowest quartile or 20% of the country has seen their income decline over the last 40 years. They're not part of the booming stock and bond crowd who've uh, done so well. Um, for, in fact, 40% of the United States doesn't currently earn enough to ever retire, um, afford um, long-term care or elder care for their parents. And that's what created what I call the wilted economy or work incessantly to you drop. So 40% of the country basically their retirement plan is they're just going to die in place. They'll never be able to retire. And so this is why we need um, the National Infrastructure Bank. So path forward is to first, there's a big argument that went on with infrastructure, which is what was needed with one group saying almost nothing was needed. And of course, the other group was saying go big, but both were desperately missing the data of exactly what is the shape of U.S. infrastructure. I personally feel the deficit is somewhere between four and seven to perhaps as many as, as much as $10 trillion that are, are, excuse me, five to $10 trillion. That's um, somewhere between a quarter to 50% of the annual GDP. So how do you tell whether that's correct or not, or not? And the answer is, you basically, you can stand up a system in Department of Homeland Security where agencies all across the country write in and, and uh, tell, um, give basically through a, a form on uh, the web what their current backlogs are and their capital proje projections, just like you would have in any major corporation. And within few, a few months, even plus or minus 20 to 30% accuracy, we be able to do we have a 200 or a $100 billion infrastructure deficit, or do we have a five or $7 trillion infrastructure deficit? And that will then specifically answer the question, is the loan on rebuilding our infrastructure as we would do the uh, National Infrastructure Bank, is that going to, uh, is the loan going to cost more or are you going to lose more through lost productivity and accelerated decrepitude of all of our infrastructure? And then we can also reshore um, all of our uh, factories that we've lost offshore, creating millions of jobs. And as I said, uh, create the National Infrastructure Bank, which I see as part of a national barn raising effort to bring the country together and to make us first again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hubbard. Uh, up next, we have Alfeka Matari. She's a macroeconomist. She's a former senior economist for the International Monetary Fund. Alfeka? Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much. And thanks for those great presentations from everyone. Uh, I think we sort of saw two themes going through these presentations. One is that we need a national infrastructure bank to provide adequate financing. Without that adequate financing from the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, we would not have been able to do all those wonderful things that the, the speakers described. A second thing is we need an institution to do the mobilization and planning. Uh, that was a big feature of the RFC. There was careful, careful one-on-one -on -one planning between uh, Hopkins and Jesse Jones and FDR. They would meet every day and plan on what their bottlenecks were and what they needed to move forward. So that's what we also need today. So if, if we could put up, pull up our first, uh, my first slide. So uh, where are we today uh, with our financing? 
Uh, one thing that we know is that we've just passed the uh, Infrastructure and Investment and Jobs Act, or otherwise known as the Senate Bipartisan Bill. Uh, that's great. We're so glad that the government was able to do this, but let's really, really be realistic. It will only provide $550 billion of new money over the next five years, and that's only one-tenth of what we need. Our real need is a minimum of $5 trillion, and that's what the engineers have cataloged as what we need, $2.6 trillion to fix transportation projects, drinking water projects, make sure that the power grid is secure. In addition, we need 21st century new types of infrastructure, including um, a, a high-speed rail network across the United States to solve our traffic congestion problems, uh, to uh, save us uh, uh, on energy, to really reformulate how we move people around the country. Uh, we need a renewable energy grid overlay to move renewable energy. For example, we're producing a lot of it in the state of New Mexico, but we have no way to move it east and west to uh, end users. And we have a terrible water drought problem in the United States uh, for which we need to really get water into drought stricken areas, just the same way that uh, Oklahoma and the Dust Bowl were addressed by the RFC and the Farm Corporation uh, financing. We also need to get water into those areas. Otherwise, we're going to have severe uh, price increases in food and we need affordable housing. We just are very, very short on affordable housing. Um, it's been critical uh, in certain states like California has the, is ranked 49th for the number of housing units per population per head. Uh, and this has caused big, huge homelessness problems. The same in Florida. Uh, we have uh, housing shortages all over the place. We need to have better housing better electric grid, get people to work uh, easier, and the National Infrastructure Bank is geared up to finance all of those. So let's look at the next slide and see where we're falling short on a state-by-state -state basis. Uh, this first line shows what uh, different select states might get uh, from the National Infrastructure Bank, and it was calculated as just simply a, a crude uh, ratio of their population to the total population, uh, matching that up with the $5 trillion the bank will provide. So a state like California, for example, would be the largest beneficiary, could get up to $588 billion from the National Infrastructure Bank. So what's been promised to California from the IIJA? Uh, an, an article in uh, Cal Matters uh, newspaper said it would only total $48 billion for the whole state on a per capita basis. That provides California with less financing than Alaska or Vermont, for example, and will not be anywhere near enough to meet their needs for road construction, for bridges, um, fall short, uh, and there's nothing in here uh, significantly at all for high, for affordable housing and a very small dollop of money for broadband. So we're not going to be moving into the 21st century with this financing for California. Let's take New Mexico next. They could get up to $33 uh, billion from the National Infrastructure Bank. Uh, uh, Senator Tallman in New Mexico tells us that really the state has not had investments since the R Reconstruction Finance Corporation and the CCC and WPA put projects back in there uh, at the time of the Great Depression and has had no uh, investment since then. Uh, the, the state has 20% of folks that don't have access to affordable broadband. Uh, their roads are severely uh, in a state of disrepair. Uh, farmers, bridges uh, have to drive miles out of their way to get their produce to market. And huge water shortage that is really affecting agriculture in the state. That same, same thing applies to California. So we'll be able, the National Infrastructure Bank will be able to provide 10 times more money than the uh, IIJA uh, Act would provide. The same is true for Pennsylvania. Could the, That state could get up to $220 billion uh, uh, over the next 10 years to solve all of its backlog of projects. And we've been encouraging and trying to encourage legislators in every single state we've talked to, to please 
come up with your list of projects. Uh, when the bank gets started, we'll put them up online, as uh, Dr. Hubbard has said, and get a rolling uh, stock of all these projects, a uh, backlog of projects that we could start dealing with right away. And of course, among them is critical to end this problem with uh, lead service lines in older cities. Uh, the, the 15 billion that's in the uh, IIJ Act for lead service lines would maybe cover the city of Chicago, but it's not going to be enough to cover every single city in the United States that has terrible lead line problems. And these have been going on for decades now. We really need as a matter of safety and urgency to fix this. We have to address our electric grid. There's very, very little in here for the, you can't even see uh, an electric grid line, line here on this table from the IIJA. They're not, the, uh, we need to pay attention to that as a matter of priority because if the grids go down, if we overburden them from new electric vehicles or uh, bringing on high-speed rail, uh, that's not going to be enough. We, we need to make sure the grid is secure. And then finally, high-speed rail is our ticket to solving um, congestion, uh, traffic congestion problems and boosting our economy. All of these things are needed and can be provided by the National Infrastructure Bank. Thanks very much. Thank you, Alfeka. Up next, we have Mary Jane Chimsky, PhD in history. Uh, Majority Leader of Westchester County Board of Legislators, former, former his, history lecturer from Marymount College. Mary Jane. Ah, thank you very much. Uh, this has been a really fun series of presentations. And sometimes it could get really eerie when you look at the parallels between a fraught historical moment that you're living in and another historical moment in the past. And one of the parallels that really struck me about this was that the Great Depression had its own environmental crisis. And it was an environmental crisis that was um, created to a large extent by unwise use of new technology. Um, Ours, of course, is climate change thanks to the internal combustion engine. Back in the 1930s, it was the Dust Bowl. Before 1870, the Great Plains states were known as the Great American Desert. And then all of a sudden, a shift in, a shift in climate resulted in a great deal more rain in the area. Now, what that rain did was it inspired people to go out and use the whole region for agriculture. So they ripped up the native grasses and they planted all kinds of crops. Now, what sometimes happens is people start engaging in magical thinking and there was actually theories that the rain will always follow the plow. Well, guess what? It didn't work that way. Beginning in 1930, there was a series of droughts for approximately 10 years because the native grasses had all been torn up for the sake of agriculture, there was nothing there to hold the dirt in place. And that created the Dust Bowl, which was not just a regional problem. There is actually one storm that dumped over 12 million pounds of dirt onto Chicago. Um, in, in the winter of 1934, New England's snow fell red from all of the dust that was in the atmosphere from, from 1,500 miles away. We all have read Steinbeck or something that tells us all about the horrible social cost to the Dust Bowl. Uh, so when Roosevelt took office in 1933, the Dust Bowl was one of the big things on his mind. How were we going to solve the problem? Well, during the first hundred days, which is when that first really big push of legislation got out the door of Congress, um, one of them created something called the Civilian Conservation Corps. The Civilian Conservation Corps was designed to um, employ approximately 300,000 young men. Um, at its height, it actually employed over 500,000. Um, Roosevelt was hopeful, 
And he always was hopeful. You could see that optimistic smile right there. Um, he was hopeful that they could plant 200 million trees and that these 200 million trees would help stem back the tide of the dust bowl, hold the soil in place, cut down on the wind. The Civilian Conservation Corps in its nine years, nine and a half years of existence between 1933 and 1942 was actually responsible for not just employing 3 million young men who needed work, not, it did not, it also did things like construct roads, nature trails, um, it, it planted food crops, it sought to do mosquito control, it built infrastructure like dams. But in the nine years of the Civilian Conservation Corps, they did not plant only 200 million trees. Estimates run to between 3 billion trees and 3.5 billion trees. Uh, hundreds of millions of those were planted in the Great Plains states. And the um, combination of the trees and teaching farmers more sustainable agricultural methods cut down the size of the dust bowl by the late 1930s by almost two thirds. It did not completely disappear until the drought disappeared in the early 1940s. But that, that push to get the environment reforested and that push to um, teach sustainable agricultural methods certainly did a great deal to cut down on the privations and the environmental catastrophe that was the Dust Bowl. Now, at this point, as we know, there are a number of serious environmental needs we have right now. And Alfeca and some of the other speakers have brought them up. We need mass transit, including high-speed rail. We need renewable energy. We need production and we need distribution. We need electric vehicles and electric vehicle charging stations. They need to take the place of our gas stations, essentially. We need climate resiliency, um, whether it's the planting of trees, whether it's moving people's infrastructure from the basement to above ground. We also need stormwater management and flood control, of which planting those trees is certainly part of the job. Now, at this point, as we know, the initial infrastructure bill, which is sort of kind of bipartisan, but not really much, um, has some environmentally useful um, funding dedicated in it. But most of the environmental funding, of course, is in the Build Back Better bill, which we are waiting, whose fate we are waiting to see. Um, at this point, our local governments, our volunteer groups are doing what they can. Um, do we have any more slides? Let's see, there we go. This is actually in, um, you could, this one I believe is in Hastings on Hudson, New York. We have some more from Mount Pleasant, New York. There are volunteer groups and groups of young people, many civilian conservation corps, who are going out to plant trees. All of those tubes contain trees. The tubes are there to protect them from the deer. We are planting several hundred at a time in flood prone areas, um, uh, flood resistant and um, water soaking uh, trees. Now, Think about 400 here, 200 there. There was a point in our history where we planted 3 billion trees in less than a decade. And when we're talking about reforestation, when we're talking about the kinds of technology that we're going to need to solve our current environmental catastrophe, we definitely need a national infrastructure bank even if Build Back Better gets built, gets passed and signed into law. Um, when you look at the numbers and you look at the fact that the Society of Civil Engineers that that 5 billion plus figure is based on, 
they've been increasing estimates on certain things. Looking at that water number, sewers are not included in there and sewers alone can be a trillion dollars or more in this country. We probably are talking close to $10 trillion. We need the same kind of big thinking and can do spirit that we had during the Great Depression and we'll be able to solve our problems now too. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Jane. Uh, up next, our next speaker is Dennis Montoya. He's the past state director of the New Mexico League of United Latin American Citizens, LULAC. Dennis. Thank you very much. And thanks to everyone attending this evening's session. Um, I've listened with great interest to some of the presentation by um, Dr. Hubbard, Ms. Shimsky, Alfeka Mutardi, uh, and Mr. Hopkins, or I'm sorry, Ms. Hopkins. And it all resonates with me. I'm a retired civil rights lawyer. I'm currently a high school teacher. I teach math and science. And especially when Ms. Shimsky was showing that photograph of the CCC, that brought some memories back to me. My father was essentially a mess sergeant with the Civilian Conservation Corps. And that was a well-chosen photograph because it showed the kitchen. Um, my dad went to high school under Herbert Hoover's administration, and he graduated and was a young man uh, under FDR's administration. Some of his very first jobs were with the Civilian Conservation Corps. I think we have a photograph where we did show a photograph from the CCC, but here's something that was accomplished in New Mexico because uh, Alfeca Mutardi mentioned that the last time we had significant investment in New Mexico was under FDR's administration, this is Elephant Butte Dam, the most significant water impoundment project on the Rio Grande. Uh, and it, it accomplishes two very important goals. First of all, it provides irrigation water for an extremely rich agricultural area in Southern New Mexico. That part of New Mexico is one of the major pecan producers for our entire country. And it satisfies our water obligations to the state of Texas, because unfortunately we lost um, a major court battle a few years back and we owe significant quantities of water to the state of Texas that my apologies to any Texans on the call, but uh, for us with a population under just hovering around 2 million, having Texas right next door is not a very comfortable experience. But what I really wanna talk about is the human cost of underdevelopment. There is a CCC camp in Sandia Park, New Mexico, and my dad worked at one very much like it in an area called La Cueva, New Mexico. There was mention I think by um, Ms. Hopkins that um, working, the dignity of work, the right to have a job is an essential human right. Well, there are large swaths of the state of New Mexico where the last time there was anything like a stable economy was during the New Deal era. And the last time people had steady and productive work and didn't have to relocate, go looking for work in Colorado or Wyoming or a neighboring state was during those years. The infrastructure needs in this state are incredible. Of course, we have some of these, the country's most well-known Scientific laboratories were the birthplace of the atomic bomb that one of our speakers referenced. But I don't think anywhere in all 50 states can you find greater disparity 
uh, in standards of living, in income, in infrastructure development. So we could talk probably for hours about these, but with the permission of our moderator, I would like to show a video clip that I think will underscore what I'm talking about. Some of you have been on a previous call and seen this, but some of you have not. Um, it is from CBS. So with the permission of our moderator, I'll go ahead and share the screen. Easy to miss this corner of the Navajo Nation, just 100 miles west of Albuquerque. Most things pass the reservation right by, including progress. Many of the roads here are unpaved. Electricity is spotty. Unemployment in the area hovers near 70%. But perhaps most shocking of all, an estimated 40% of the people who live here don't have access to running water. And the sink, what does the sink do? We don't use the sink because there's no running water. It's just there. Yeah. Loretta Smith and her husband shared this small mobile home with their disabled granddaughter, Brianna. Seven? That's how old? With no indoor plumbing, what little water the family has inside is carried in, bucket by bucket, stored in plastic barrels outside. Do you feel sort of forgotten out here? Yes, for sure, yeah. There is substantially more to this video. I encourage all of you to look it up on YouTube. It is titled, the Navajo Water Lady. Human dignity demands jobs, demands infrastructure development, demands a decent standard of living. New Mexico LULEC, that I had the honor of serving as director, and I believe our, direct, our current director, Fred Baca, is on this Zoom session, has wholeheartedly endorsed H.R. 3339 because we see the benefit that it can bring to our constituent community. I think everyone here sees it also and understands. I need to get back to teaching my math class, but I want to <laughs> thank everyone for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Montoya. Uh, and next, our seventh speaker is Michael O'Brien from Albany, New York Common Council. Hi, um, I'm amazed by the wealth of history and science that uh, these tutorials are giving us. Uh, I um, didn't really know much about the uh, efforts to create a uh, national infrastructure bank until our county legislature passed a resolution supporting H.R. 3339, and I have my grandson here with me is, yeah, for babysitting tonight. Um, but uh, at that time, I, uh, you know, followed the lead of our county legislature and our city council passed a resolution on November 1st. And I've been able to sit in on some of these tutorials. Uh, but, you know, as I started to think about it, I did realize, and that map, that uh, uh, Ms. Hopkins presented, uh, certainly had Albany as one of those dots from the 1930s. And I do remember my parents telling me that uh, the Albany water system was actually built as a work progress administration program. And uh, prior to that, we got a water from an aquifer. And then what they did was they went into the foothills of the Catskills, the Elderberg Mountains, and they built a reservoir system and about a 25 mile tunnel serving not only the city of Albany, but serving our neighborhood towns and uh, going to a, a WPA built reservoir on the north side of Albany. Hey, yeah, no, and you gotta be quiet for a minute, okay? Um, so uh, I, can all, I can start to appreciate you know, Albany has lead pipes in some of its old uh, water structures. That's certainly a need that, that we would have to get replaced. And, uh, you know, I guess the, the main uh, focus that I would have now is 
how do we get the word out? This is a picture of, uh, I believe that was a pumping station as part of the 1930s project, but it involved much more than that, I know, because it actually involved uh, 25 miles worth of a water, uh, water tunnel, which is about six feet in diameter, which is still in use. And as I said, so it's not just Albany, but the interreading towns between the Heldebergs and Albany, which is about six, six town trips. Um, so we did our part, um, got a little bit of notoriety through the county legislative action and through our city, uh, you know, resolutions. These are, of course, just resolutions. But to me, the uh, the big thing is getting the word out, and it's great, you know, how understandable the presenters tonight made it in terms of the history, in terms of its impact on uh, uh, an Indian reservation which doesn't have running water, and in terms of the science, what uh, what what can be done if you get the government and banking systems working together and if we got the insight of Franklin Roosevelt, who anticipated our needs not just during the uh, not just during the depression, but also in preparation for World War II, and got that partnership working before, so that we could ramp up in two and a half years what Germany and Japan were ramping up in ten. So it can be done, and I appreciate inviting me to just learn from these presentations. Thank you very much, Mr. O'Brien. Uh, before we get to any uh, to a question and answer period, we have a few other people who'd like to speak real quickly here. Uh, we have Stan Forcheck, who is former Amtrak executive, and he's an infrastructure expert. Stan. Randy, thanks so much for the introduction. And I have to say, I, I'm very impressed with all of the speakers tonight. Uh, I, I I really feel for the folks in New Mexico, along with other states that don't have running water, and the situation is terrible. Uh, and I think we have to do something about it. And that's why we talk about the bank and moving it forward. You know, one of the things that uh, came out of uh, Stephen's uh, uh, discussion and also Dr. Hubbard's and also uh, Ms. Hopkins uh, is the the, the New Deal, the RFC, and everything that occurred back in the 30s. I want to bring you back a little bit further, as Mary Jane had, uh, so, uh, had, had pointed out. And I want to go back and talk about the electrification of um, the, um, the Northeast Corridor as we know it today. And I want to talk about the electrification project. Now, we all know that the roadbeds had already been put down in the late 1890s and early 1900s. But the goal was to get into New York City from the West, New Jersey at the time. And that would create commerce between the North Northeast uh, states and the Mid Atlantic states, which at the time were the most populous in the country. And we had to do things to get that commerce done, uh, 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 in other words, in gear. The Pennsylvania Railroad took it upon themselves to electrify. This is a map of the electrified territory for the Pennsylvania Railroad. There are spurs that go out and, and everything, but we're talking about this main line, which goes from Washington, D.C to New York. Steam locomotives used to go on this track and the tunnels were built between New Jersey and uh, New York about 1910. But those tunnels could not relieve the smoke from uh, uh, what was being spewed out by those locomotives. So the frequency or the windows of opportunity to move people uh, were not enough to really do anything. So the Pennsylvania Railroad started thinking about electrifying. The problem with electrifying was there was a utility company in New York, there was a utility company uh, within uh, the northern part of uh, New Jersey. There was one in Philadelphia, there was one in Baltimore, and there was one in Washington, DC. 
They were non-synchronous. They couldn't talk to each other. The power couldn't move that far. So there were a lot of hurdles. And what, what had occurred very simply was studies had to be done to figure out how to move trains. Now I'm talking about this now and it leads directly into the discussion of the RFC. You had to be able to move those trains. There was no way to plug them in. Research was done on the main line uh, that Pennsylvania Railroad had between Harrisburg and Philadelphia. They experimented with locomotives. They experimented with frequency. They studied the physics of electricity. That all had to be done. And eventually, this drawing, which comes out in 1916, explains the overall situation, which is we have no way of plugging in the train. The train can't move. I used this three separate times while I was with Amtrak, the last time being when we electrified New Haven, Connecticut to Boston, Massachusetts. I used it for a rate case and I used it to design uh, uh, that portion of the railroad. So the issue was how to do that. And the Pennsylvania Railroad came up with that idea. They put in a series of frequency converters, somewhat similar to what New York City has for their subway. They have frequency converters every block in New York City. Here, the utility companies couldn't talk to each other. So we actually had to create transmission lines, take the power from one utility, convert it to a different frequency and put it on the Pennsylvania Railroad's transmission system. Hence, they created the first power grid in the United States. There were no power grids. The utility companies did not talk to each other. There was no high voltage transmission. There was nothing but these trains. So they created the first power grid. This is what it looks like out on the railroad. This happens to be the Harrisburg line. You can see that there are multiple tracks. There are There is a catenary system that runs the train and there's a transmission system above. That's exactly the way the power grids operate today. High voltage transmission and a distribution system for each one of the houses or businesses within that district. So the Pennsylvania Railroad created that uh, first power grid. The Pennsylvania Railroad also was use the RFC to build different lines, the lines going from Hoboken, New Jersey, out to Western New Jersey. It also built this line here going up to New Rochelle because remember New York had the Grand Central Terminal which came into Manhattan. Right here is Queens, right here is the Bronx. This bridge right here is the Hellgate Bridge. It's 100 years old. It's been there a long time. But again, this railroad that goes all the way up to New Rochelle here was built utilizing uh, the RFC financing to do that portion of the project. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Stan. Uh, real quickly, we've got a few more speakers that would like to speak for a couple minutes. Uh, the former New York Assemblyman Felix Ortiz. Uh, good evening, and it's a great honor to be with all of you uh, tonight. Uh, this is uh, an amazing, this is an amazing academic uh, exercise. And I would like to say that I have learned from every single one of the presenters today, as well as I have learned since we've been together on trying to get this legislation or resolution into the finish line. I guess I would like to touch on two points. In 2014, uh, I introduced uh, 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 legislation calling for a, a bond act of $2 billion for infrastructure and sewers in New York State. When I did that, everybody thought that I was crazy, that that bill would go nowhere. And everybody paralyzed when I began to visit uh, every municipality and mayors and county exec throughout the state, the 62 municipalities, 61 counties and trying to get support behind me. Today, Chuck Schumer make a big announcement. We have a great win in New York. We got $27 billion, which 157 
millions of dollars will go to Austin, New York. Well, Mr. Schumer, I will say that I appreciate what the work that everyone has done, but this is not taking us to really to the next, to the future of the next generations. And I think that we're still shortchanging our community. And bottom line, in conclusion, I would say, understanding politics and coming from polity for almost 30 years, I understand that, uh, that politics is local. And I know people are more concerned about their relation, uh, their election and re-election rather than concentrating on the well-being of our country. So I hope that this will help us to continue to strengthen every single one of us to move forward to ensure that we will be able to get the real legislation done in Congress and make every single member of Congress and the US Senator accountable for. So thank you for having me and good night. Thank you, Felix. Up next, we have Kansas Representative Casey Ohebison. Well, thank you very much. I'll keep it very brief. I'm actually, uh, uh, Casey Ohebison, a representative from Kansas. I'm actually honored to uh, be here and actually to learn more about uh, this presentation that's been given tonight. Of course, uh, with the uh, National Investment Bank that I've been talking, of course, this will actually impact mo uh, majority of the, uh, the people of color, you know, throughout uh, the state, uh, throughout the uh, nation, you know, in terms of investment, much needed investment uh, with respect to infrastructure. So uh, uh, the dialogue I've heard is, is tremendous in terms of, you know, for, from all the way from FDR all the way till today as to what really needs to be, to be done here in our, in our nation. So uh, again, we really need to work together, uh, make sure that we are actually talking to our members of Congress, both from uh, uh, actually from the state level all the way up to the federal level to, make, to actually emphasize the importance of this particular uh, bank. So I'm definitely in, in, in support of it. I thank all the speakers who have spoken tonight. They've spoken real well. And you know, I look forward to work with everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, OK, so we'll go on to uh, Oregon Democratic Committee and Jack Hanna. Thank you, Randy, and thank you, everyone, for providing me with an opportunity to speak to you all tonight. Uh, uh, it's such a great group of people that we've uh, uh, cobbled together uh, to uh, advocate and uh, work towards uh, the establishment of another national infrastructure bank. I would like to just briefly compare uh, the leadership styles of FDR with uh, what we need and want and have to have today uh, with regard to our current president, Joe Biden. And I would specifically respond uh, uh, to Virginia Congresswoman Spangberger's recent comment about President Biden after the November 2nd election earlier this month when she said, and I quote, nobody elected him to be FDR in response to his advocated policy and legislation, funding infrastructure and build back better. Senator Manchin also approved of her comment, thus the reason for including uh, the states in the title of our program tonight, Virginia and West Virginia. What are they really saying here? And should we accept that assertion? I, for one, completely disagree with that premise and believe most of us on this call tonight do also. What we do all agree on is that FDR was a great president, that he led our country in a time of economic crisis and also prepared and successfully enabled us to win World War II. We can also agree that as a candidate and since inauguration, President Biden consistently and continuously advocated for a bold approach and response to our country's challenges regarding the pandemic, global warming, and the income disparity that increasingly threatens our nation's ideals, well being, and existence. That's similar, although perhaps not to the same extent, to what FDR faced in confronting a collapsing national banking crisis. 20% uh, plus unemployment, and thousands if not millions of people trying to survive on stone soup. These are ambitious and I suggest necessary goals. As a country, 
we have always wanted from each and every of our presidents strong and insightful leadership that is required to address the circumstances we as a nation confront. To say that President Biden wasn't elected to think that way is a mischaracterization to say the least and a misunderstanding of what leadership our country needs now in the future. Why wouldn't America intend to elect someone who is as aspirational and inspirational as FDR was, who led the country out of the Great Depression and then led our country to victory against Nazis and fascists across the world? Why wouldn't America want to elect a president that wants to rebuild our country's dilapidated and crumbling infrastructure that has been ignored for 70 years and imperils our public safety, our economic well-being, and our children's future, just like the huge threats of our country uh, faced 70, 80, 90 years ago. Why wouldn't America want to elect a president that would prepare our country for the 21st century economy by modernize, modernizing our outdated 20th century infrastructure so as to compete in the present and future world economy? Why wouldn't we as Americans expect and even demand that our elected officials exercise the same type of bold, insightful and necessary leadership that FDR provided then and employ it to address the challenges we face now? So yes, Virginia, and yes, West Virginia, this Christmas, there is a desire, a hope, an outcry throughout the country that we need and perhaps must have the same approach to our country's needs as was employed by FDR then. If there wasn't an intention to elect an FDR on November 3rd, 2020, I suggest uh, it um, is, uh, there is an outcry now for President Biden to be bold as he was as far as economic policy is concerned. The National Infrastructure Bank is absolutely a necessary and integral part of that. Let's work together in common to build and rebuild better, or should I say build back better than ever before as far as our country's economy in a way that benefits us all, not just the few. Just as SDR, FDR showed us how to do it before, let's go forward with the same aspirations, goals, and leadership he provided. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Uh, and one more, we got uh, New Mexico Senator Bill Tallman. Senator Tallman. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, I've been uh, very active in this uh, effort for the last, uh, for the past year. I'm a strong advocate and a big supporter of the, of the NIV. Um, talking about the New Deal, I attended a, a high school in upstate New York, or actually it was K through 12, but it, it was a, a, a New Deal project, a gorgeous building, uh, brick, red brick with uh, colonial uh, features. And it's, it's been well maintained. It still uh, remains a beautiful building. And uh, it was built in 1937. I started kindergarten in 1945. So it was a brand new school and they built a lot of uh, beautiful uh, school buildings in upstate New York uh, at the time. So I've been very active. I've uh, uh, sponsored a resolution in the uh, New Mexico uh, legislature uh, urging Congress to uh, pass uh, 3339. I've written several op-ed pieces that have appeared in the largest New Mexico newspaper, been on uh, made a short appearance at the uh, regional meeting of the Council of State Governments. And uh, we've had uh, and had a couple of Zoom meetings with uh, the congressional delegation of uh, in New Mexico. I've been to China twice. The, the infrastructure will blow you away. Uh, the, the, the futuristic airports, the, the uh, bridges of their works of art in um, high-speed railroad. They have thousands of miles of high-speed railroad. We don't have, the United States doesn't have one. China spends 8% of their uh, GM, G, GMP on uh, infrastructure. Europe spends 5%, we spend 2%. You know, and, and several uh, people tonight have mentioned the fact that 
the uh, general public as well as Congress is not aware of the, the need that this 1.1 trillion bill is far short of what is needed. The media and Congress act like this is the answer to our prayers. Well, it's not, it's already been described, it's far short of what we need. You know, a lot of experts are saying we could spend the $1.1 trillion just on water structure, uh, water infrastructure. Here in, um, New, uh, in New Mexico, there's only a third of a billion dollars for uh, water infrastructure. And I talked to the state engineer yesterday and he says we could use uh, two, two billion. So we're only getting we're only getting one sixth of what we need. We're getting no money for infrastructure for uh, the electric grid, which is uh, in New Mexico. We are the second sunniest state, one of the top five windiest. So we have a lot of potential to produce uh, renewable energy. And the experts who are in charge of transmission lines in New Mexico tell me that we are fast approaching within months of not being able to, to uh, transmit any more of our, our uh, renewable energy. Um, the, uh, uh, we have uh, broadband needs. Um, it's gonna cost $1.7 billion to provide broadband to all of our households and we're only getting um, 100 million for that, so which is obviously far short. So this $1.1 trillion infrastructure recently signed by Biden is far short of what we need. And unfortunately, the general population and Congress is not aware of this, such an important. So if we don't, uh, China, even if we spend this $1.1 trillion, we're gonna, we're gonna still be behind uh, ch far behind China, we need to spend five to ten trillion dollars in order to, to uh, be on par with uh, China. So I uh, urge everyone to uh, do what they can to uh, inform the public and and, and uh, meet with your Congress people to to uh, inform them that the fact that what they've done is far short of what is needed and what we need the NIB in order to close uh, the gap. So thank you for the opportunity and uh, I urge everyone to continue working hard on this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Tallman, for being on. Uh, is Ellen Brown on? Great presentation, thank you very much. Very informative, I'll put it in our, if there's a rerun, I'll put it in our newsletter for Public Banking Institute. I'm chairman of the Public Banking Institute and of course we totally support all this. <laughs> Um, I do just for purposes of I don't know if you have time for questions, but uh, just for sure. purposes of like I tend to write about this stuff and you know there's blowback about fascism is actually a combination of government and corporate right so how do you distinguish working with corporations and not, you know what I mean that not letting the. I guess the, in this model, it's the government that makes all the decisions, right? And they just hire the corporations to do the work. Uh, I'll back over. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't think that you could, could look at FDR's policy and say that it was a fascist policy. I mean, it was there to fight fascism, there to get us out of win World, win World War II, to, to save democracy, to save banks, uh, save everything. And so I, I just don't see how it was the thing that was needed at the moment to transform. And what we have now is a very devolved economy. Our America, we used to be first in the world and now we're falling way, way, way behind. And we need a little bit of central mobilization and, and extra financing that the, the federal government budget is not providing in order to get our economy going again. And I wouldn't call that fascism. I would just call it good governance. Yeah. Well, I'm, I mean, it seems to me the obvious thing to do would be to just print the money like Lincoln did or like what or like, uh, you know, Franklin would have done or whatever. But uh, I mean, that is our American tradition. That's pretty much how we were founded on our own currency. Yeah. But we can't really do that. But and, you know, uh, Omarova in uh, I wrote an excellent I thought it was an excellent paper on uh, 
on uh, setting up a uh, central bank digital currency. Now, I know there are a lot of downsides to that, but it seems to me that what we should do <laughs> is just issue the money, not even make it as a loan, but just issue it. Of course, there's the argument that it's inflationary, but as we saw in the Depression, is if you put it, put the money to work, instead of right now, what happens is they print money and it goes into speculative things. And so, of course, you get bubbles and busts. But if you put the money right into productivity, hire people, put it, you'll pay people, but you'll pay them to do some work, um, then then you'll have some products that you can spend well, we the need, money on. We need, a, we need a special institution to do that. I mean, we cannot leave this exactly. up to the Federal Reserve. Their record has been terrible. And I'm telling you, um, uh, Ms. Omarova's uh, proposal to take all of the deposits out of my bank and put them into the Federal Reserve, the very first thing I would do is take all my money out of the bank because I wouldn't trust the Federal Reserve, given their record over the last few years uh, to, to handle that. We need a national infrastructure bank to print the money, create uh, the money that is given out in loans and direct it to productive investments. And without that mobilization and institution to do that, that has that sole mind and purpose, uh, then we, we won't get the benefit of the investments that we need. Yeah, well, her model actually had that in there though. I mean, she called it the National Investment Authority or something like that. But, you know, it would be an independent thing. It wouldn't be the Fed that would be making the loans. It would be an institute set up. Anyway, you know, those are just the things I work on. So I don't want to use up your time, but great, great job. I really enjoyed all the, all the um, um, visuals and information about the Great Depression. It's so relevant to today. Okay, is there any other questions? I have one Question here. Uh, let's see. Uh, senior policy making circles are still debating the merits of public private partnership to build infrastructure. This weekend, the Washington Post ran a scathing expose about a new PPP to build toll lanes along corridors of the infamous DC Beltway, connecting the Maryland to Virginia suburbs. Rush hour one way tolls are slated to be $50 each way. This policy has already been adopted as moving toward implementation. Do you have any comments on this? Anyone like to speak on that? Nobody wants to touch that one. So okay. it's, it seems to me the difference is between that and something like the National Infrastructure Bank, which would also use corporations, is that in this case, you're actually giving the whole project with its profits to the corporation. That's right. And what, what we want to do is a federal agency that hires um, individual contractors to build parts or whatever it is that they do, but they don't get the profits other than from their own business. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that that too. And Stephen Hubbard has some uh, excellent examples as well. But the, the bottom line is it's A, not going to solve traffic congestion. B, it's going to cost uh, consumer uh, commuters a whole lot of money. And at C, as uh, Ellen says, it's going to put the profits in the hands of the entity, which will design the thing so that it can maximize and milk out as much money as it can, rather than what's in the public good. And that's why we need a public bank to design what's in the public good. Okay, thanks. Uh, Sarah Manning, do you have a question? Yeah, no, I have a response. Um, okay. I'm part of the Alliance for Local Economic Prosperity in New Mexico, and we feel very strongly that a state public bank is the missing tool here. But as to regards, Ellen Brown, you are a hero uh, to many people, but let us all remember that the purpose of government is to serve its citizens, to serve the populace. And so the public good is an essential charge of the government, any government. And so when the government, when governments partner with profit-making um, entities, public-private ownership of tolls, that is a an essential conflict of interest, and we should not go there. So anyway. Uh, this has been a fabulous presentation. I've had my sister here. I'm in New Mexico. She's in Virginia. Her eyes are opened. You need to do more of this stuff. This is really good. Coverage. Thank you. This week we placed ads in the 
Buffalo News and uh, Florida News. Uh, an op-ed was published in the Ohio Sentinel Tribune, signed by a dozen Ohio elected officials. Uh, ads and op-eds have appeared in a dozen newspapers across the country. And the ad, the, the op-eds we can usually get to, they will print them, we can get them to print them for nothing, but the ads are costing us money. And we are a grassroots organization, we have no sponsors. So we don't have a whole lot of money to throw around. So at this point, we're, we're trying to put some ads in now. So this is the fundraising part of the, the conversation. Uh, we, they're telling me that we need to raise like $500 in the next couple of days to put a couple of ads in that we've got scheduled. If anybody can would be able to contribute to us and help us out, so like I said, we're grassroots. Uh, we very much appreciate it. Just go to the nibcoalition.com website and there's a donate button on there. If you can do it, any, any amount you can do for us would be wonderful. Uh, and this, you know, we've shown, he's shown some of the reporters, some of the supporters, I mean. Uh, and then, you know, calling members of Congress, call them. Ask them to co-sponsor the HR 3339 uh, to help us out to create the National Infrastructure Bank. Talk to your friends. Get it out there. Get, get out, you know, get, so people get to know what this National Infrastructure Bank is because it's a win-win situation. And I want to thank all the, all the speakers we had. This is the best one I've seen so far. I appreciate it. And uh, all the people that, that came to came to watch it and, and ask questions and, and learn a lot. So it's been, it's been wonderful. And uh, I want to thank everybody for being here. Thank you. Great job. <laughs>